Following his 1824 election loss to John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson is going to start to change politics in the United States. So as we've talked about previously, the United States, when the Constitution was written, the Founding Fathers had intended to put layers between the people and the government. Generally, they didn't trust the average American to make decisions such as who should be representing uh, a state, who should serve in national government, uh, who should be serving in the Senate, the House of Representatives. So as we talked about, presidents per the initial Constitution were chosen by these electors, who the Constitution says states, you choose these electors, find some qualified individuals, send them up every four years, and they're going to decide who the president is. Senators... Uh, per the original Constitution, chosen by state legislatures, and then uh, House Representative members are going to be chosen by a popular vote. So this is one instance where the people are going to directly uh, be involved in, in the national government, but states can set restrictions on who can vote for the House Representatives. So most states, when the Constitution was first written, only allowed people of substantial property uh, to vote. And as we talked about, most states put restrictions of voting based on uh, property. That's, uh, that's, that's nothing uh, new. Now, uh, states in voting all will put restrictions based on sex. Some will put restrictions based on race. So the national government has this president not chosen by the people. He's chosen by these electors who are chosen by the state legislatures. State legislatures, they might be chosen by the people, but then they have these layers before who becomes president. Again, senators chosen by state legislators uh, who are chosen by the people. So there's one layer between the people and uh, the senators. And then the House Representative members, again, they're directly elected by the people, but states can put restrictions on who can vote for the House of Representatives. And as we saw initially, the only people allowed to vote are those uh, of property. So this is the way the United States democracy starts out. It's not very democratic. It's more states are the ones participating in the national government. And then at the state level, you know, uh, it's going to vary how the state set up um, who chooses the state legislatures and that type of thing. But there's a layer between the people and um, the national government. Well, this starts to change when you have this conflict between the Republicans and Federalists in the 1790s. Again, the Republicans, Jefferson's party, sets himself up as the party of the people, of democracy. They start calling for expanded right to vote. And they know this is going to appeal to a lot of Americans because most Americans can't vote. And so we'll see Jefferson, and he's going to start in his home state of Virginia. We'll see some of these other southern states follow him up. Uh, they'll start lifting property restrictions from House Representatives voting. So initially, when uh, it first comes out, you have to own $1,000 in property. And again, this is going to vary from one state to the next. But now they're going to say, nope, every adult male, white male, and, and a good chunk of states can now vote. So no longer is it restricted by property. And then we're going to see when the Republicans get in charge and essentially the Federalist Party goes away uh, during this era of good feelings, the Republican Party, they're the only game in town, so why not make it more democratic? It's not like they're going to vote another party in. And so what we saw in the 18-teens is these, uh, and we saw this a little bit before that, but instead of allowing the state legislatures to choose the electors, to choose who they vote for, a lot of states are simply going to hold elections and they'll tell the people, vote for who you want uh, to become president. So when uh, James Monroe is uh, going up to be uh, uh, voted in as president, instead of Virginia sending electors uh, to Washington to choose who the president is, Virginia will hold an election, the people will vote for uh, James Monroe, and then Virginia is going to tell its electors, go vote for James Monroe. So now you're seeing the people directly vote for the president, and you're seeing people, uh, these property restrictions lifted from who can vote for the House of uh, Representative members. So things are way more democratic than, uh, uh, than it in, uh, the founders had intended it to be. Again, this doesn't matter during the era of good feelings because the only party in town is the Republican Party. Well, what we saw after the uh, Andrew Jackson lost 1824 election is we're going to get this competing party to the Republicans. So John Quincy Adams 
He's the president. He's the head of the Republican Party. Andrew Jackson grows upset because he loses in the 1824 election, sees John Quincy Adams appoint um, his uh, his secretary of state, Henry, uh, Henry Clay, as the secretary of state. And what Jackson's going to say is this is bargain and corruption. They made a corrupt bargain uh, to rob me of the presidency, again, because the vote had been thrown to the House of Representatives and the House of Representatives had put Henry Clay um, uh, or had put John Quincy Adams a- as president. So Jackson breaks away from the Republican Party and he's going to form this Democratic Party. And this Democratic Party with Jackson as its head is going to start this four year campaign to make Jackson president in 1828. And what Jackson's going to do is he's going to start to appeal to the average Joe Schmo, who prior to recent years, you know, according to the original Constitution, couldn't have voted again because states had property restrictions from voting um, and states had basically, uh, you know, chosen their electors. But now that states are allowing the people to vote for who the president are and there's no property restrictions. Now, Joe, you know, uh, Joe Schmo with no education, he can vote. So what Jackson and his new Democratic Party are going to do is they're going to start appealing to those guys uh, to vote Jackson in his presidency in 1828. So Jackson breaks away, forms his Democratic Party, and this Democratic Party is going to appeal to this much more Democratic uh, Democratic uh, uh, United States. Uh, Jackson, by the way, when he breaks away, he's going to bring with him John Quincy Adams, vice president, John C. Calhoun, sees how popular Andrew Jackson is. He sees it. He appeals to the average man. He thinks that Jackson has a good chance of getting elected in 1828. Calhoun basically says to John Quincy Adams, I'm going to stay your VP, but I'm gone. I'm, I'm leaving your party. Imagine that happening today. Imagine the sitting president has their VP switch parties. That happens to John Quincy Adams. It's not just uh, uh, John C. Calhoun. Uh, you're going to see other prominent Republicans like this guy, Martin Van Buren. Um, he's a prominent New Yorker. He's going to leave to Jackson's Democratic Party. Um, Martin Van Buren does this not necessarily because he believes what Jackson believes. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't know what Jackson believes, and they don't know what this Democratic Party stands for. They just know that Jackson, uh, the people like him, and if you join his party, there's a good chance it's going to get you a position of power. So Martin Van Buren, this lawyer from New York, this guy who uh, has very little in common with with Andrew Jackson, will defect to his party. And as we're going to see, uh, Martin Van Buren is going to be one of the heads of Jackson's new election campaign. Basically, he's going to be the one coming up with ways to appeal to this more uh, democratic United States and these new voters that previously couldn't have voted. So Martin Van Buren uh, will defect to him as well. And Jackson, he's going to set up this campaign headquarters in Nashville. And what he's going to do from there is he's going to start pushing for more people to leave the Republican Party and join his Democratic Party. And he's going to start campaigning for the eight, uh, uh, promoting candidates in the 1826 congressional elections. Basically, Vote for Bob over here because he's part of my Democratic Party. Uh, don't vote for Steve. He's staying with the Republicans and their bargain in corruption. He's staying with uh, John Quincy Adams' party. And we will see Jackson's Democratic Party either through people switching from the Republicans or people beating Republicans in the 1826 congressional elections will um, uh, come to power in Congress. And so many are going to come to power that poor John Quincy Adams isn't going to get very much done as as president. So very qualified person as secretary of state. He'd uh, been incredibly influential as president. He's going to be having to deal with this headache that is Jackson's new party. John uh, John Quincy Adams is also going to be having to deal with the headache, the fact that and he knows that in 1828, he's going to be running against Andrew Jackson. And basically, you can almost look at, again, from uh, the end of the election of 1824 to 1828, a four-year campaign because it's almost it's obvious to everybody that Andrew Jackson wants John Quincy Adams' jobs. So John Quincy Adams is sort of having to look behind his shoulder at this freight train, this Democratic freight train that's going to be uh, coming up on him in 1828. Well, uh, what we're going to have when 1828 does finally come around and this 1828 election is going to merge, we're going to see what everybody knew was going to become. Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams 
will be facing off uh, against one another. Again, John Quincy Adams, this Republican Party that had been begun uh, with Thomas Jefferson, uh, but by this point had changed, as we talked about. It's very much more similar to uh, 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 Hamilton's Federalist Party. Um, it's going to be running against Jackson's Democrats. What do Jackson's Democrats stand for? I don't know. Jackson. That's really what they stand for. It's just, this is my party. I don't like the Republican Party anymore, so I'm forming a party around me. What are you all about, Jackson? People actually don't even really know. They just know that it's, it's, if you like Jackson, you should vote Democrat. So what we're going to see in this 1828 presidential election is the first true campaign in presidential history. Even when you had uh, John Adams, the original John Adams, versus Thomas Jefferson, they were in separate parties. They were mainly appealing to electors. They were appealing to elites for uh, who's going to vote for them uh, in the Electoral College. These guys are actually appealing to the general voter because, again, uh, this is the first time where most of the states, there's two different parties, and most of the states are allowing uh, the people to vote for the presidency. So what we're going to see is this almost first instance where you're going to have what we would call modern election tactics, okay? So today, when we have candidates go out, the way they campaign, it's basically a lot of times they're going to appeal to voters that might not be the, uh, you know, sometimes they'll appeal to voters that are intelligent, but a lot of times they're just going to sort of appeal to the guy, you know, that might not know a lot about politics, might not be well-read on the issues. And they're going to employ these tactics that try to get the human brain to to vote for them. You know, it's not necessarily going out and laying out your platform and uh, speaking educated on the issues. It's winning votes any way that you know how. Okay, so this 1828 election, we'll see, and this is going to be Jackson introducing these things because he's been working on this for the past couple years while John Quincy Adams was president in preparation for this uh, 1828 election. So what do I mean by modern election tactics? What are these some of these things we're going to see in 1828? Well, one thing is going to be avoiding the issues, all right? So if you, today, if dur you know during a presidential election, if you ask a candidate about a controversial issue, what are they going to say? So let's say it's Social Security. I'm just using this as an example, but let's say it's been determined that Social Security can't last as it currently exists, and the only way to save Social Security is to uh, make it to where you have to wait until 70 to collect Social Security. Again, I'm, I don't know if that's a real issue. Just making it up. If a candidate says that they're going to raise the Social Security limit or reduce the amount people receive in Social Security, they're probably going to lose a lot of votes from the elderly. But they know they need to do it. So... They know one thing, and they know when they become president, they're, they'll end up doing it. But during the campaign, they don't want to lose those votes. So if a reporter goes up and asks them and says, what do you think about raising the age limit in Social Security? Or what do you think about, um, what do you think about you know, uh, decreasing the amount people can receive in Social Security? Well, the candidate doesn't want to lose votes. So what they'll do is they'll avoid the question. So, oh, what do I think about raising Social Security? I think America is awesome. I think that puppies are great. I think that apple pie is fantastic. And, you know, I love my mom. I'm, I'm just there for taking care of grandparents. Well, what do you mean about Social Security? Shh, 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 just be quiet. Um, let's just talk about America. They don't talk about it. They do not address the issues because they don't want to lose votes. Okay? This is a modern thing we do. Prior to 1828, you didn't see the, the avoiding the issues. Again, you know, the candidates are talking to electors. They want to be clear on the issues, and they know they're talking to people that are um, uh, well-qualified and understand politics. Now they understand they're just talking to average Joe Schmo. So what you'll see when uh, people ask Jackson questions, he's going to avoid it. And he has the luxury to avoid it because he hasn't been a politician. He hasn't been forced to take stands on uh, issues. So when um, uh, people come up to him and they say, what do you think about the tariff? It's going to put Jackson in a weird situation. So the tariff is this, uh, the tariff I'm referring to is the United States had put increased duties on incoming manufactured goods in order to promote American manufacturing. So you've got 
uh, completed shirts coming over from Britain. You know, not wool, not cotton, not anything that's, you know, a raw product, but something that's manufactured, run through a factory. The United States had put a high duty on, on these goods coming into the U.S. because they want people to buy uh, American manufactured goods. So they want to basically artificially raise the price of goods coming, manufactured goods coming from France, Britain, things like that. Now, this is great, and people in the north like this because there's a lot of industry up there, and it helps American industry. People in the south don't necessarily like it because they're producing raw goods. They just want the cheapest manufactured goods. You know, we need uh, uh, shirts, we need uh, shovels, we need whatever, and we don't care if it comes from Britain. We don't care if it comes from the north. We just want the cheapest possible. So, in general, the people in the south don't like it. Now, some had supported it previously um, uh, just because... Um, uh, just because, you know, it helped the United States and it, it, it decreased the reliance on Britain, but a lot of Southerners don't like it. Well, when um, somebody asked Andrew Jackson, what do, you, uh, what do you think about the tariff? He doesn't want to say I'm for the tariff because that will lose him votes in the South. He doesn't want to say he's against the tariff because he knows that's going to lose him votes in the North. So what he says is, I'm for a judicious tariff. I'm for a judicious tariff. What the hell does that mean? What does judicious mean? It means nothing. So basically, he's trying to tell people in the North, I, I, I like the tariff. For, and, and, you know, and for the South, you know, I'm for a tariff that's fair to you guys in the South. It means nothing. It doesn't, uh, he doesn't say I'm for a 30% tariff, you know, because he knows that's going to lose him votes. So I'm for a judicious tariff, which, which is meaningless. Um, John Quincy Adams, by the way, he could not uh, have this luxury. He had to take a stand on it because as president, uh, a bill went through Congress, and this was actually pushed by Jackson's Democrats to force John Quincy Adams to make a decision. Uh, that basically, they uh, it called for an increase in the tariff, and Adams had to approve it. Again, this made people in the North happy because they liked the tariff, but people in the South didn't like it. So Adams, as president, had to sign that into law, so he had to make a decision. Uh, Andrew Jackson didn't, okay? All right, so this is one thing that uh, uh, Jackson's going to do, avoiding the issues. Uh, by the way, one, one other quick thing about 1828. So John C. Calhoun was sitting vice president for John Quincy Adams. In 1828, he's going to run as Jackson's vice president. So he defects to Jackson's party. And so basically, if Jackson wins, John C. Calhoun's going to stay in the same position. Uh, he's running for the opponent as vice president. It's a wild-ass situation. All right, so we have these guys that are uh, um, uh, introducing these modern electric tactics. Another thing that Jackson and his party will introduce is stupid slogans, parties, false promises to gain votes. Again, this is something we're used to today. We're used to politicians coming up with, you know, uh, yay America or, you know, um, uh, lit, lit America soar. These, these are horrible. I'm just making these up off the top of my head. But you have people, they'll come up with a fancy little image and they'll come up with a little slogan and they're going to put this on, you know, billboards. They're going to put it on little signs out in front of people's houses. And it's things that, you know, they're not saying their platforms, they're not saying what decisions they're going to make. It's just things to sort of appeal to maybe the lizard part of our brain, just get something back there in our head and stick with it. And they're hoping when people go to the voting booth, uh, it's going to convince them to, to vote for their candidate. And again, this probably won't work on most people, but it might work on some people. Well, Jackson's going to, in his campaign, are going to be the first to take this to this next level. So Jackson, uh, when he had fought in the War of 1812, he'd fought the Creeks and then eventually the British at the Battle of New Orleans, uh, he'd earned the, the name Old Hickory. So basically, um, they said he was uh, tough like a hickory tree, didn't back down to the Creeks or the British, and he'd earned the name Old Hickory. Well, this had become popular among the American people, so during 1828, they're going to play up the name Old Hickory, and what they're going to do is they're going to start planting hickory trees at, like, campaign events. So if you're a supporter of Jackson, come here to the town square. We're going to plant some hickory trees because Jackson's going to put roots in America, and, and America's going to grow with Old Hickory. What they would do is they'd have these little campaign things, and they would hand out hickory brooms. Uh, stand with Old Hickory. Here's a hickory broom. Sweep out the corrupt uh, John Quincy Adams and his corrupt uh, uh, pol uh, politicians out of office. Get those Republicans out of there, and let's vote in Jackson and some Democrats. Uh, so Jackson will play up his, his nickname, okay? Um, Jackson and his supporters are going to start 
uh, uh, holding barbecues uh, for people. So it's not necessarily vi- buying votes, but they uh, Jackson will will get support from um, you know people in his party, you know people that support him, and he's going to take some of this money, and then he's going to have his supporters go from town to town, and they'll hold a little campaign rallies, they'll hold barbecues in the hopes of getting people that are maybe undecided voters to filter into this barbecue and saying, hey, here's free meat. Who are you voting for? I don't know yet. Well, hey, this meat's provided by Andrew Jackson. Just just remember that on Election Day. Um, and so you know, appealing to the common man um, uh, to get what they, uh, to sort of play up their appeal. We're feeding you. Jackson's feeding you. Uh, not only that, Jackson will play up his war hero image so he's going to uh, basically bring up the fact whenever he can on the campaign trail. You guys remember when I beat the British at the Battle of New Orleans? I'm pretty badass for that. John Quincy Adams wasn't fighting in the War of 1812. Where was he, that coward? Now, John Quincy Adams was actually negotiating the peace with Britain uh, over in Europe. He was playing his part, but uh, being a peace negotiator negotiator isn't as cool as being a uh, war hero. So uh, poor John Quincy Adams has got to let Jackson, hear Jackson play this up. As a matter of fact, uh, Jackson, in, at the beginning of 1828, uh, he went to uh, the Battle of New Orleans and he put on this big show for reporters like, you know, it was uh, 13 years ago that uh, people fought and died for me. Like only a handful of people died for him, and why are you celebrating a 13th anniversary? Forget about that. It sounds good, so uh, Jackson will play up his war image. Um, Jackson, you know, is going to play up uh, some things that are true. He absolutely was a war hero, did assist the United States in War of 1812, but he's going to play up some things that uh, aren't really true. Like he's going to portray himself as a church-going, God-fearing uh, Christian person. Now he, Jackson probably would be a Christian, although some of the things he would do, you know, wouldn't necessarily be a Christian, but he would be portraying John Quincy Adams as godless, you know, a godless atheist who is uh, uh, an aristocrat. Well, uh, a rich aristocrat. Well, the rich part's uh, true. John Quincy Adams was the son of a president, but uh, he certainly wasn't godless. John Quincy Adams up from Massachusetts, again, you know, it's the heart of sort of uh, church country up there in the Northeast. The Puritan elements have died down, but it's still incredibly uh, uh, Christian. And so John Quincy Adams went to church every every Sunday and uh, was an avid re- reader of the Bible. But uh, Jackson's going to play it up as if he's the Christian person. And that sort of feeds into another element of these modern election tactics that Jackson will introduce. There, you're going to see in 1828 this what's probably the dirtiest election in American history. Now, 1800 was dirty to an extent, but, you know, a lot of these smears were just to elites and things like that. Now that the average everyday man is uh, is able to vote, we're going to see particularly Jackson's campaign, but Adams' campaign will get on it, are going to try to convince voters that the other guy is an awful person. Okay, so what we'll see, uh, for example is Jackson will play up not just the fact that John Quincy Adams is a rich kid, but they're going to say things like, you know what he does in the White House? He plays billiards. Billi- and that's actually true. You know, John Quincy Adams did enjoy playing pool, but at the time, that was viewed as like snobs play this. Uh, they'll play up the fact that uh, John Quincy Adams' was, uh, wife was British, you know, so uh, uh, sh- she's basically, if, if, if he continues, he's going to be like a king. Uh, uh, Jackson's not like that. He's, he's a man of the people. They'll also accuse John Quincy Adams of things that are completely untrue. You know, some of this stuff have, has basis in truth. Some of it's just completely made up. Um, they basically at, at one point say that John Quincy Adams, who had he'd served as uh, American ambassador to Russia at one point, they sell the, say that he sold a young American girl to the Tsar of Russia as a prostitute. There's no truth in this. I mean, it, it's just simply not true. This is just made up. But Jackson's campaign will play it up like it's true. And at least a couple of people are going to say, you know what I heard? I heard he was a... Uh, I heard he sold a American girl to the pros- as a prostitute to the Tsar of Russia. Um, I don't want that guy as president. Again, not true, but you know Joe Schmo, uh, farmer who who previously couldn't have voted, now he can vote. Um, he he doesn't have time to investigate whether this is true. Uh, so they're going to start playing this type of thing up. 
Um, John Quincy Adams and his campaign are going to come back with their own attacks on, on Jackson. So if you attack John Quincy Adams, we're going to attack you. And some of their attacks are just going to be completely made up. Uh, like they'll say, Andrew Jackson uh, had black ancestry. Again, if you're talking to uh, the United States where a significant portion of people are racist, uh, if you indicate somebody has African ancestry, that's going to be perceived as negative. Um, some of the things, you know, completely made up like that. Others are going to have an element of truth to them. Like uh, 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 John Quincy Adams' campaign will accuse Jackson of murdering some soldiers during um, the War of 1812. Now, Jackson didn't murder him, uh, these soldiers, but there were some men during the Creek War who had signed up for a militia uh, unit during the Creek War, which is what Jackson was commanding, and they thought their time in the militia was up. They went to go home. Jackson basically accused them of mutiny and desertion, had them executed. Was it probably too much? Yeah, you know, it. there's a lot of sort of debate about that, but it was probably excessive. I don't know if it was exactly murder, but that's what John Quincy Adams uh, is going to, in his campaign, will portray it at. That, that if you elect this guy, he's going to be a murderer. And they bring up the fact that when he invaded uh, Spanish Florida and executed those British soldiers, saying they were spies without a trial, you know, hey, if this guy's a president, he's just going to be killing people uh, left and right. Uh, interestingly, uh, they called Jackson uh, a jackass. Say, do you want this jackass in here? And Jackson will take that, like, uh, Jackson the jackass. All right, fine, we are a jackass, and Jackson will make that the symbol of Democratic Party. And this is the same Democratic Party today. Now, obviously, uh, the, the party has changed dramatically. Um, again, the party's only really about Jackson at this point. But the Democratic Party does owe its donkey or jackass symbol to um, John Quincy Adams' campaign calling Jackson a jackass. Now, John Quincy Adams, probably the biggest attack they're going to levy on Jackson is going to uh, involve uh, his wife, Rachel Jackson. So uh, Andrew Jackson had married his wife, Rachel, when Rachel had been married previously, okay? So we've talked a little bit about divorce in early American history before. Getting a divorce in colonial America and then early United States was difficult, but it could be accomplished. Basically, if you were somebody, a woman whose husband was abusive, uh, or if there were certain extenuating circumstances, you could appeal to initially the colonial government, but then the state government when, when they became independent. Uh, you could appeal to the state government. The state legislature would hear why you want your divorce. My husband's being abusive. Uh, and the state legislature would grant a divorce. Now, they wouldn't do it all the time, but if in most circumstances, if it was proved that the husband was uh, uh, allowing or was uh, abusive, they would permit a divorce and they would legally grant this uh, uh, separation. So you could get divorced in uh, early United States. It wasn't as common as it is today, but it wasn't unheard of. Now, the thing about divorce back then, though, was it did take time. So basically, you would separate from your spouse, you know, I go live here, th you know, this person lives here. Then you would appeal. A lot of times you'd have to get a lawyer for this. You would then appeal to the state legislature. State legislature is only meeting once a year. So, you know, it's going to take a while for your appeal to get there. And then when it gets there, maybe they don't even have time to hear it. So sometimes it would take, you know, over a year to get a divorce, sometimes even more than that. Well, Rachel Jackson had been married to an abusive man. And she's going to move in with her parents, uh, and she's going to appeal to the state for divorce. So her parents, they run a boarding house, basically a hotel, and Rachel's going to be there. She's going to help her parents out as she's waiting for the state to grant her divorce. Her husband's off, and uh, uh, you know he's doing his own thing. He's actually upset about the marriage breaking up, uh, and he's slandering his wife, things like that. Well, Rachel's sitting there at, at her uh, parents' house, uh, and... This young guy, Andrew Jackson, comes along. This is when he was a, a lot younger. Uh, and he and Rachel Jackson begin having a relationship. Now, Jackson and Rachel will claim that they're having this relationship after having learned that the state legislature has granted the divorce. So it's legal. They're not doing anything wrong. And then after the state, they learn the state legislature you know, is granted this, that's when they begin their relationship, their courting time, and then this is going to turn into them getting married. Well, 
uh, John Quincy Adams' campaign is going to argue that they actually started cohabitating, living together, and they even got married before the state legislature of Tennessee uh, granted the divorce. So these guys are sleeping together, basically, you know, they get remarried when Rachel Jackson is still legally married to her previous husband. Now, we think that that's actually true. Um, although we think that they mistakenly had thought that the state legislature had granted the divorce, a lot of debate over this, but whatever the case, you know, in reality, you would understand this this scenario. You know, you can't wait forever. Jackson comes around, you guys fall in love. State legislature is going to get around to it eventually. So we may as well start uh, living together, getting married. Um, so they think they're doing it legally, although it's possible that, you know, they did even before, uh, you know, started cohabitating before the legislature granted it. But again, you know, this is out on the frontier where, where they're getting married and whatever. They probably actually started dating and even probably got married before the state legislature granted a divorce. So technically, Rachel Jackson would be a bigamist, which means married to two people at the same time. But it's probably understandable in, in today's, uh, uh, today's standards. But that's not how John Quincy Adams' campaign is going to portray it up. They're going to basically portray it as this woman is a hussy. That's the word they would throw out. Harlot. She was sleeping around, sleeping with multiple men at the same time. Is this the person you want as your uh, first lady? Um, uh, Rachel Jackson, she would hear this stuff, this horrible stuff uh, told about her. Andrew Jackson was trying to shield her from it, trying to throw away newspapers before she could read it. But she's getting her hands on this, and, and this is generally hurting her feelings, hearing people say these awful things about her. She actually gets incredibly depressed during uh, the campaign. So we're going to start seeing these attacks and these personal attacks uh, more so than, than any time previously. Now, it's, it's usually not these two guys directly calling each other names. Usually they're letting the people under them, you know, uh, do the mudslinging. You know, maybe it's uh, one of his campaign managers uh, saying John Quincy Adams is selling uh, women as prostitutes. And one of uh, John Quincy Adams' campaign people calling Rachel Jackson a, a, a hussy, that type of thing. But uh, these guys are certainly com condoning it, okay? So this election, incredibly dirty. It's also going to be incredibly corrupt. So states... There, again, you know, it's one of these weird things in, in the United States. States are the ones that set the standards for uh, how uh, their elections are going to be held because, again, it's going to be the people voting for who the electors vote for. Well, some states that are friendly for Jackson, you know, if they have state legislatures that are friendly to Jackson, they're going to make sure that when ballot boxes are sent up to the state legislature, they're going to make sure that the people vote for Jackson and some ballots will get thrown out uh, for John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams friendly states, they're going to make sure to throw out some ballots uh, for Andrew Jackson. Uh, so you're going to see an incredible corruption on both sides. So dirty election, modern tactics, appealing to these uh, new voters. Well, when it comes out after elect, uh, elections are held in uh, November 1828, uh, Andrew Jackson will win fairly sizably. Um, Jackson is going to get uh, win the popular vote by fairly uh, large margins, uh, 642,000 uh, to 500,000. By the way, that's twice as many people that were voting in the previous election. Part of this is due to, you know, uh, you had uh, property restrictions lifted, but they had actually been lifted uh, in most states, vast majority of states, uh, a couple uh, before then, in 1824, 1820, and in the 18-teens. It's just that nobody really had a choice when voting. You're voting one Republican candidate versus another Republican candidate. Now there's two very different people, and so you're going to see a lot more people going to the polls uh, this time around. So uh, Jackson wins a popular vote, but popular vote doesn't matter in American history. Again, the founders set it up to states, uh, get this X, X number of electors, and uh, these states have, have all chosen to um, uh, hold elections. South Carolina, by the way, still state legislature chooses its electors, uh, but other states uh, by this point, people are choosing it. And Jackson's going to win the Electoral College uh, fairly significantly. He wins a majority of votes, which is uh, is going to hand him the, the presidency. Well, this is going to mean uh, 
basically what we're going to see here is once Jackson takes over the presidency, which he's going to do in March 1829, he's going to have his fingers in in uh, the politics either directly as president or indirectly, definitely until 1841, and you can even argue uh, a, a decade beyond that. A lot of people are going to call this the age of Jackson because we'll see Jackson, once he gets in charge, He's going to make sure he stays in charge, and he's going to do a lot of things to change American politics. Okay, So this election ushers in this age of Jackson. Uh, another thing about uh, this election, um, again, with Andrew, Andrew Jackson winning uh, and then um, John C. Calhoun as his VP. Again, John C. Calhoun doesn't go anywhere. He's already VP under John Quincy Adams. It's just now he's VP under Andrew Jackson. But one other thing about this election of 1828, this thing will kill Rachel Jackson. I mean, it literally kills her. So she had been reading all this horrible stuff. Her health started failing during 1828. Now, I don't know if it can physically kill you if if somebody, you just hear all this awful stuff about you. But if you have other medical conditions, it certainly does uh, prevent you from uh, fighting as effectively. I mean, the mind has a weird uh, uh, reaction to that kind of thing. And Rachel Jackson had been having heart problems, and uh, shortly after the election, she's going to have a heart attack. She's not going to recover from the heart attack, and she will die. Well, Jackson is going to blame her death on the dirty politics of 1828. Now, again, Jackson, you can say hey, you're the one doing most of the dirty politics, but Jackson's going to basically argue, all right, well, that's different. John Quincy Adams, and he's also going to put Henry Clay in there because Henry Clay's John Quincy Adams' Secretary of State, throw some other Republicans in there as well. He's basically going to say, their attacks murdered my wife. Um, and as a matter of fact, at uh, Rachel Jackson's funeral, uh, Andrew Jackson's going to make this speech where he basically says, uh, and this is actually a quote, God forgive her murderers, I never will. And by murderers, he doesn't mean her heart because she had a heart attack. He's specifically talking about John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay and these Republicans that had said awful things about uh, Rachel Jackson during the campaign. All right, so Jackson, he wins the presidency, but he loses his wife. And, and by all accounts, Jackson loved his wife. They're, they're uh, a very close couple. He's going to be incredibly depressed uh, after uh, she dies. Um, and it's kind of this sort of weird situation. You're entering the presidency, but you're not uh, with the person you love. So when Jackson arrives in Washington in March 1829, he's not really in a mood to celebrate, but all of his supporters are. Again, Jackson had been appealing to average Joe Schmo. Now they have their candidate uh, taking over the presidency, so Jackson's going to come in in a carriage, and when he arrives at the White House, he's going to find essentially a mob has formed out the, outside the White House to celebrate him, to welcome him into the presidency. John Quincy Adams had to actually sneak out of Washington because he was worried that Jackson's supporters would rush the White House and, you know, rip him to shreds or something because of uh, uh, Jackson, you know, what, what he had said about Jackson during the campaign, or at least his campaign had said about him. So John Quincy Adams just sort of gets out of there because a mob is forming out here to welcome Jackson. Well, when Jackson gets to the White House, he doesn't want to party. Basically, he just enters the White House, he goes upstairs, and he just sits in his room, is all depressed. But he leaves the door open, and he lets all these people th that... Uh, you know, the same people he'd appealed to, a lot of these people, you know, that sort of lower class, just uh, average Joe Schmo, you know, now uh, excited about their candidate, just li just lets them right in the White House. And by the way, when they get in, there's so this huge party uh, and a lot of uh, sort of uh, White House um, uh, ornaments and paintings and stuff will get ripped off the walls, thrown to pieces. Now, this is kind of interesting because you can look at this celebration as one way. You can look at it as this is the people getting their say. This is a, they're getting their candidate in place. Uh, this is a triumph for democracy. But if you're somebody like maybe Alexander Hamilton, how do you think he's looking at this? He's looking at this as like, well, this is what happens when you let the mob into this decision making. This is the ruffians or whatever. This is the the lower classes. Um, uh, just tearing things apart and, and uh, that they don't know anything about. So, again, uh, th this is almost indicative of what we're going to see to Jackson. He appeals to the people. 
but some people uh and some people will uh commend him for that you're you know taking out the elites for the average joe and then other people are saying you're appealing to people's base emotions uh to get what you want and this is going to continue on uh through the rest of Jackson's presidency